What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Got a lot of fun things to talk about. Today, we'll be talking about things I wish I would have known when I was starting on Ham Radio. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, for the super chat question, absolutely. As as wide band receive you can get is better. You know, I love wide band receive. I I think it's uh, good emergency situations. What do you want? You want to be able to hear all the signals you possibly can. So yes, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> uh, maybe you just start off all streams like that. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> again, thanks everybody for coming out. I'll say it again. What are we doing on the Ham Radio Crash Course? We're trying to create a fun, welcoming, inclusive environment for people to ask questions like that. And and sometimes I'll I'll talk, talk like this and I answer it. it. <laughs> but that's not going to be the normal. And hey, I apologize for that. Oh man, that's making me laugh, making me laugh at myself. And you know what? If you can do that with Ham Radio, you're going to be very well off because you're going to make a fool of yourself uh, from time to time. It happens. Uh, let me throw it over here. By the way, if you're watching this. Click subscribe. I appreciate it. You know, um, I put out a lot of content, and you know, if you just don't like the subscription, you just click, click it. It doesn't cost you a thing. So click that subscribe button. Thank you very much. Uh, let me throw it over here because I do have uh, to talk. Oh, man, that was ridiculous. <laughs> Where did it go? Uh, why is it all messed up again? You got to be kidding me. It did it again. I just lost like uh I still have the slides. Okay, good. <laughs> God. Well, I got that. Okay, good. Man. Let's do it that way. Why did that happen? <laughs> there it is. Why did that happen? So weird. Anyway, we got it sorted out. Wanted to throw it over to the wonderful work that my wife is doing at hamtactical.com. She put together a whole bunch of new shirts, and it was a byproduct of the ideas that people have sent to her at layathamtactical.com. We did a vote, and we selected a new set of items but the big one was take the CW pill. Initially, it was take the red pill, but I hope you appreciate the uh, play on words that we did here. So Leia put this together, take the CW pill. I thought that was uh, pretty good. Nicely done, Leia. So over on the Super Chats, man, thank you so much for the Super Chats. Uh, Full-on auto-tune stream. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. Sorry about that. I appreciate that everybody stuck through it. Pass my tech uh, anchor drop says pass my tech in 14 days ago. Nothing back yet. I am in the fires and need a radio. Oh man. Well, get a radio if it's an emergency. You can still use it. You know, just in case. Adam AD6 DM with the 556. We should let Hosh, <laughs> Hosh run an auto tune lo uh, longer. That yeah. If nobody said anything, I would have just kept going. I still don't know why that app does that. It's really weird. It's set up on a push button, so I can push it and turn it on, but it defaults on sometimes. Like, why would that be a thing? Uh, so there's the CW pill. But she did a bunch of other ones, like uh, some Helvetica shirts, AM, FM, CW, and single sideband. Those are not – there you go. So those are the modes that are most prevalent in your HF radios. Uh, this one I like, just add operator, microphone, radio, amplifier, antenna. Uh, <laughs> this one, she another Helvetica ham radio and YouTube and Facebook and Discord and podcast, the HRCC. Very good. And if you haven't, go to hamtactical.com and read the description on the items. You, you really owe it to yourself to do that because they're, they're quite funny. Uh, she put this one together, 20 meters, 40 meters, sleep and repeat with, uh, with some interesting flip text on top of there. So for those of you that, that know the day-night cycle, what are the two bands, at least that I'm on most of the time, is 20 and uh, 40 at the nighttime. And last but not least, I'm wearing the original. So I used, uh, what was it? T-Fury, T-something. T it was the YouTube swag thing. Um, 
and I made this Helvetica shirt, and it was it was not great. The the material that they used and the printing was not good, and so she redid it, did it much better. She took care of a lot of the the font facing and whatnot for our favorite uh, Mark, you know, Hertz, Armstrong, Marconi, Morse, and Taylor. He's on the list. So yeah, very very good. Thank you, Leah, for doing that. Make sure you check out the descriptions. Rob Matheson just got my vanity today. Good evening from K4 GPM. GPM. All right. Well, you may have to tell us what that means in the uh, in the uh, uh, the chat. I don't get it, but maybe somebody else will. Very cool, though. I'm glad you got your uh, your vanity. A couple of uh, things I want to. One news item, and uh, then I want to throw it over to link links are in the description for this stuff by the way this is just fun uh stuff i stumbled on i'm in a facebook group called uh, crystal set radios and this guy made this really really cool blog post on the recreation of their first working crystal set from 1966 y anybody could build this right you can you can source these parts from uh, you know you can make the coil most of these little metal clips are available and you need to get the capacitor the uh the 365 capacitor but you know anybody could build this and it's a fun little project and he put together a really cool story of how he talked to his friend billy uh with wrist radios kind of through in his small town so the link is in the description you know i i i just stumbled on it. i thought it was a really cool cool little thing there and he walks through the whole thing look at this crystal sets if you don't know uh draw their power off the transmitted received um rf and uh, you, you use a crystal earpiece to receive it, and that kind of makes all the difference. But, yeah, you, you, you don't need power to this. It, it just receives off the ambient air with whatever antenna you're using. And he goes through quite a bit of effort. He does have a battery there, but you don't need a battery. Yeah, so very cool. Check that out. I recommend that, uh, that highly. Right, and so here's the news story for the day. Ham radio wireless network camera detects a Washington wildfire. So Nigel van der Howen, K7NVH, reported on September 8th that some Han Wan users in Puget Sound region of Washington who were viewing the network's camera spotted the large brush fire. They reported it to the Department of Natural Resources, which thanked them for the first report they had gotten on the fire, and they sent a team in to try and keep it small and under control. It's estimated currently at around 50 acres, and the fire was not said to be threatening any homes. State Route 410 was reported closed between um, uh, Unumclaw and Greenwater, and drivers heading to Mount Rainier National Park were advised to take another route. So Ham Radio, through its uh, Hamwan system, had a camera attached, and they were able to see a fire that popped up. And there's a picture. Let's check out the picture. There you go. That was the shot from the uh, Hamwan video camera that they had set it up, or webcam, or whatever they were using. Very cool. It's a big, big image. Pretty decent fire there. It, it could have been anyway. Hopefully they were able to knock it down. Pretty cool. Right on. All right, and then uh, let's see. One more. Where did it go? Contest calendar. So contest calendar on the eight day. There's a lot going on right now. There is an EME contest for Earth, Earth, Moon, Earth. There is a DX contest. There is a Sorrel Field Day. The Straight Key Co or Straight Key CW Society Weekend Sprintathon is on, and that goes from the 12th to the 13th. And then you have Ohio State Parks on the air, right? Texas CUSO Party, Alabama State uh, CUSO Party, and the AWRL Sep uh, September VHF contest. So VHF contest, I believe, is anything two meters and up. So if you're interested in that, if you like working simplex. Now would be a good time to check that out. So it's a, it's a busy weekend for ham radio. There's a lot of stuff that um, that you can do out on the air this weekend. So I hope you check that out. I'm going to grab a beverage. Leia picked up some beverages and said, you should drink these on the stream. And I said, okay, I will. There is a, um, what do you call, what do you call a place, a cidery? cidery anyway this crispin is the brand and they make hard apple cider but they have like a brute a prosecco and a rosé and this one is the brute i happen to like brute champagne uh i like dry anything i like dry ciders so i am going to try 
the Crispin. Crispin makes really good stuff, by the way. I believe they're out of jo um, Julian, California. Does it say on here? No, this one's in Milwaukee. What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of another. I think it's... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Crispin's good. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's check on the chat. Oh, yeah. It's on the um, the dryer side. That's sweet. Very good. Uh, the the uh, the ciders that we get in the United States, very, very sweet. Very sweet. And that's not generally what I like. All right. Getting through the chat here. We saw Dennis earlier. Oh, I see temporary offlines in the house. What's up? Good Game Hound Radio. Good Game Ham Radio and Outdoors is here. What's up? Anime, anime. How's it going? The chat moves so fast now that um, I, <laughs> I, have to, I have to keep up because I'm talking to you, and then I try to look to the chat and back and not lose focus. It's, it's tough to do. It's tough to be a, a streamer of any, of any type. You know, hard work out here. We're working hard. Oh, my God. Brad Ward just said Crispin is a Miller product. Oh, no. <laughs> Dan Smith uh, asks, I have no idea what I'm doing. What radio should I get? P.S. Those better be White Claws. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so it, I'm probably not saying it right. Zwayed, uh off the cuff. Consider joining us over on Discord. The link is in the description for our Discord server. On the Discord server, there is a wealth of people. We will be doing an after chat after this live stream over on the Discord, and it will be text and voice. And we can answer your questions a little bit better. Uh, this is deeper questions that you're getting into, and it's probably a better place to, to handle them there. You can hop over them right, right now and start asking while you watch the stream even. So cheers. Chaz R says, I connected with Johnny, W5KV, on the Texas QSO party. Johnny was streaming today, so that's awesome. <laughs> right on. Very cool. Okay. Well, so what are we talking about? We're talking about a little bit of my lessons learned, things that I learned and, and really kind of fumbled through as I got started with Ham Radio. I also pulled in uh, answers from other people, and I also you know, took any kind of comments I could get, and I pulled from our Discord for this topic for some of the questions. So what are we talking about? What I wish I knew when I was starting out. It's it's such a big hobby, and there's so many interesting facets and, and complexities to it. And I by am no means the expert on any of this. And, and really, there isn't one expert across the board in ham radio. There's so many parts to it, so many interesting things that you're, you're going to be searching all the time. So I'll say this right up front. Uh, always be looking for the answers to your questions online, books, you know, all that good stuff. Of course, talk to people. You'll get a lot of information from just talking to people, and that's awesome. Continue to do that, but maybe remember that you're you're going to be learning for a long time, and things will come along that will completely change some of the things that, that you knew and that you understood, and you'll just have to roll with it. So anyway, super chat from Brambo, like Rambo, but Brambo. Could be like Brembo, the brake calipers. Four seven uh, four seven nine one. Thank you for the super chat. All right, failing helps you learn things, but hopefully you only have to fail once to learn the lesson. There are th things in ham radio that I fail with uh, multiple times. Sometimes live streaming, uh, I'll leave the voice changer on. So that's that's really good. So starting out in ham radio, it can be tricky for anyone. Ham radio is complex and broad. That um, should not be surprising that our preconceptions don't end up working out. Case in point, how many watching this right now have bought, thought that a Baofeng can talk to people in other states, right? That you could just pick it up and you could just talk hundreds of miles on it. I get that question all the time. And many learn later, generally later, that those are VHF, UHF radios and that they're line of sight, meaning... They can only transmit the RF to the point where the horizon starts to fall off, right? It, it just continues to go and go and go and, and breaks through the atmosphere, and it's gone. As we talked about last week, and, and this stream is kind of a, a partner with last week's stream about getting onto HF radio. So if you're interested, you know, go check out the link for that. I'll put a card up so you can follow along if you're watching this after the fact. But please watch that stream. 
Brad Ward says, haven't been able to watch your stream for a while. Glad to see you're still plying your trade of, of screwing up. Yes, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always finding new interesting ways to screw up live. I just tell myself, you know, I'm pretty good at recovery. <laughs> I'm pretty good at recovering from failure. <laughs> and I can laugh at myself. All right. So considering what we just said, VHF, UHF, line of sight. That's 2 meters, 70 centimeters. 6 meters, also VHF, UHF, but it can benefit from some sporadic E. By the way, 2 meters can too. We had Ham Radio DX on the show. He talked all about sporadic E. Fantastic, fantastic episode of the stream. If you're interested in that, also on my channel, check that out. 10 meters is starting to dip into HF a little bit. It can benefit as well from some, some sporadic E, but it generally performs better at the high sun cycle. I started to learn the kind of like intricacies of the bands as I got more involved in radio, right? I, I just started out 2 meters and 70 centimeters as, as most people do. 12 to 17 meters, I'm not trying to glom them all together because they are different. They have their own unique things. But starting to get into the higher frequency side of HF, random openings can occur and it can lead to some really long contacts. And they're, it's generally a daytime band. 20 meters is my preferred daytime band. It is likely to be busier throughout the day. In fact, um, I'm looking at my 705 right now, and it's just loaded with, uh, with frequencies and, and people activating and, and operating. So uh, very, very cool that there's so much activity going on right now, and, that, and 20 meters is good for that. 30 meters is CW and digital only, but lots of fun at night. I've gotten lots of really good FT8 contacts and digital contacts on 30 meters. 40 meters is my nighttime band. That's about 7 megahertz, similar to 20, but at night. It's a smaller frequency space, and it gets invaded by shortwave broadcast stations. So you generally, uh, if, you, if you wanted to make the most of 40 meters, you should probably think about getting your extra. And 80 meters, which is nighttime band generally, and lots of rag chewing. Lots of people hanging out, chatting on the radio. There's more than that, but I see that a lot. And they're big, big stations that are on 80 meters. Lots of power. So yeah, if you're if you're concerned about 80 meters, a lot of people bring up 80 meters a lot, and that it's just a bunch of you know fuds uh, sitting out there chatting. You know, if, if that's not really your thing, maybe grab some of your buddies, find an empty space on 80 meters, and start having your own rag chew right talk about the things you want to talk about i'm always impressed when people say oh, all they do is talk about blah 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 this or that well if you don't like it you know get some friends together do a sked coordinate get on the air on 80 meters where you know where, where you can all right so one of my first lessons learned is sometimes going with a mobile radio is a better idea I used to take my FT60 everywhere. It was the first radio I bought. I still own it. Still works. Battery packs pretty degraded, but and what I would do every day, I would I would get up, I'd listen to the radio, I'd get in my car, I'd untwist the SMA connector, twist on the car uh, quarter wave lip mount that I had on my Honda S2000, and I would drive into work. And I would have a speaker mic on my on my uh, uh, seatbelt. And I would talk to people like that. Now, eventually, I, I kind of wised up and I moved to BNC, which that was another lesson learned. Hey, BNC really helps because you can just quick disconnect on and off really good. It wasn't until later that I ended up getting a mobile radio. And I, I didn't even realize like how much different it was to go from just 5 watts output of an HT to the 50 watts output of a mobile radio. It was... It, so much different simplex became much more effective right so if you think about it the, the way to think about this you know we talk about s units right you're in s9 you've heard me say that before that's the signal strength you're pegging my meter at an s9 that's like full power like really good signal well if a five watt station right five watt versus 50 watts every time you double power it's half an s unit right so five to ten half an s unit 10 to 20, half an S unit. 20 to 40, half an S unit. And then you know, a little bit of change from 40 to, 10, uh, to 50. But you get the idea. Big, big upgrade. Second thing, uh, another thing I learned. Testing HT short, uh, standing wave ratio SWR is a nightmare. 
So for that reason, don't sweat too much on HT antennas. Even the best HT antenna is still an HT antenna. If you want the best performance out of your handheld or your mobile, you know, get a, a nice two meter. And a, nice doesn't mean expensive. You can make it yourself. It's not a big deal. But tune up a two meter ground plane or a J pole or something like that, and you're going to get really good results. HTs are convenience items, right? They're not necessarily for maximizing your radius of effect. There's a lot of good ones out there. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But testing HT antennas, I get that a lot. Um, oh man, what's the best HT antenna? It, you know, it. you will get a bump if you upgrade from the rubber duck in most cases. And the rubber duck is what we call, you know, affectionately the stock antenna that comes with, with a handheld. But just going to a simple, you know, upgraded antenna, you're already going to do much better than a rubber duck. And, and again, I, I've tested that with SDRs. I, I set up my SDR at home, turned on my recorder, recorded the video, so I got waterfall and audio, and I was able to hear myself at different locations as I drove around, and I tested a ton of HT antennas. If you want the straight up, like, what I think is what everybody should get if they're starting out and they, you know, they're, they're starting out, you know, they can't really decide on what they want to do. I still say signal stuff, signal stick. It's made by the uh, hamstudy.org team and it helps to support the website that they put on to help people get licensed. So still, it's a good antenna. It's balanced for, you know, tuning on both two meters and 70 centimeters. It doesn't favor either band. And once I got that, I was like, oh, man, this is kind of going to be the antenna that I put on most things. And that's generally the antenna I have on whatever I'm daily driving. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is one that I learned really, really early. And, and this is – I'm just – I'm laying my cards down on the table. I'm telling you my ham radio story. There's a couple of repeaters I go on, uh, one in particular, where it's fast. There is not a lot of uh, – unkeying uh, courtesy wait time between people talking and there was this <laughs> there's this guy super loop as he's affectionately called and if you didn't duplex and duplexing means you had a secondary radio or you had some way to listen to the the receive on the repeater while you were transmitting so people were just colliding with each other constantly and this individual super loop would never have a duplex radio and there was a recording of someone saying super loop duplex or shut up duplexing is the concept of having something that's receiving while you're also transmitting and that's full duplex you've heard that term before for like a satellite radio now on that repeater it was kind of skirting the lines of of legality in some cases but the point of this is it's not a bad idea to have a backup radio in a couple of cases because I'm sure you've all experienced this, if you have a repeater that has any, any popularity, that people will double with each other all the time. I've been on repeaters where there will be two people talking, and they will be talking at the same time, and they will talk until they time out the repeater, basically, about three minutes or so. And due to the way FM works, one of them will generally be holding – you know, they'll be holding the PTT. Whoever has the most power into the repeater basically takes the whole thing over. So you'll get like a minute of one guy talking. He'll unkey. And then this other person who was replying at the same time, he pops in and he's saying the reply to the first guy. It gets crazy, crazy confusing. So if you can, it's nice to know that you're not stepping on somebody or that when you, you know, when you're transmitting. Also, what you can do, which works really well, too, is key up and say, do I have it? Or, you know, key up and see if you've, if you've got the transmit, right? And then let go. And if somebody's talking, well, you know you don't have it. and You can stop. So capture effect. There it is. Forget your life. Nailed it. Thank you for the th – th that's, uh, that's a good question to remember, too, because I believe that's a part of the general license. I don't think it's a part of the technician. But capture effect. Basically, the largest, most powerful station takes on the, the repeater. But I'm sure everybody that is active on repeaters has been through this. It's it's very funny when it happens. If you're given enough time between transmissions, you don't need a duplex, right? That's what everybody tells you. Yet doubling happens quite frequently and often. Happens all the time on the repeaters I'm on. And and we're talking about they give <laughs> they give huge amounts of space, huge amount of time for people to jump in. And and yeah, they, they still step all over each other, which is funny. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about what I learned. That was just the intro to some of the things I learned about HTs, handhelds. Uh, first things first, that tennis ball uh, container, big hot tip. Throw all your antennas in those. Save them if you have tennis. You know, if somebody plays tennis, I don't play tennis. My wife plays tennis. I save the little uh, plastic containers. I put my antennas in there. All my HT antennas go into the little uh, tennis ball containers. What are they called? They got a name? Container, right? Anyway. So I this happened to me. Somebody told me, you need to check out a Baofeng. It's like a good emergency radio. It's very wide-banded. So I went, oh, Joshua West got, did he see it? Did he see it? K9KO, is that on the frequency? But I think, I, I, or he knows who quoted that uh, super loop duplexer shut up. I'll probably get an at. Somebody will, will tag me on, on a group, a Facebook group about this. But yeah, it's no joke. It, it does help. And, and it gives you some knowledge about how repeaters work. So I, I get this bell thing, and everybody's like, hey, it's super wide banded. And then I'm like, all right. So I go and try and tune up CB, and it you know it goes, cancel, cancel. Everybody's familiar with that tone, I assume. And this is, again, I, I, am, I am telling you what I failed at, but this is like a you know, long time ago, long time ago. Um, the uh, the CB frequencies obviously won't work on the Baofengs. The, they're VHF, you know, radios and CBs down in the 11 meter area, right? So what wasn't ever going to work, but I had to try it. And then I had to go, well, why isn't this working? I was told this is very wide banded. And that led me down the rabbit hole of picking up the box and going, oh, this only goes down to, what is it, like 135 megahertz or something like that? Oh, I realize that it can't go down to 11 meters. It, it won't reach those low frequencies. But I had to learn that for myself. You, you could. I could just bug everybody and ask them, why can't I get my Baofeng to program CB? But what I ended up doing was literally looking it up and going, oh, it just it won't go there. Right? You can Google what the CB frequencies are. You can look in the box and go, oh, okay, this won't work. But that happened with me. Uh, GPS and APRS, while amazing, amazing functions that you should have on your radio, they're lots of fun, super capable, great stuff. It, it adds a ton of flexibility and options when you're outdoors or doing whatever out and about around town, having fun. It will absolutely drain most batteries. And the D72, which was my first kind of foray into the world of APRS, that thing has a boba straw that's sucked stuck right into the back of that battery and it just sucks the juice out of it i swear you can drain that thing in like two hours and that was brand new uh running gps and what i would call probably too fast transmitting aprs but sometimes when you're driving or if you're hiking so hiking has a lot of elevation changes and if you have that thing in smart beaconing and smart beaconing is basically where the radio senses change in direction speed and elevation and it will transmit more packets I, I think i blew through my battery on the way to a summit before i even got to the summit on that ht so yeah it kind of soured me on uh on, on some things <laughs> with with that radio in particular phil derail or derail says it eats d74s as well i've heard that i don't have a d74 I should probably get one and, and review one at some point, but I haven't done that. Even, and, and we kind of already talked this about this, but even great HT antennas are still HT antennas. And case in point, that is the Signal Stuff Signal Stick, the one that I, I recommend. I have a BNC adapter on my Yesu FT3DR, which is my daily driver HT. I just clip that thing on the side of it. Actually, I'll say my, my daily driver for VHF UHF has been my ICOM 705 for the last like week now, and it is uh, a lot of fun. That's why that angle, that's why that right angle is on there, because I've been using that with the 705 and it's been fine. And I hooked it up out of the backpack, does the whole thing. I got a backpack video coming out here soon, so I'll tell you about how I set up my ICOM 705 backpack. Hmm. I should mention this now that we're 30 minutes in. By the way, you've got 20 minutes to get in on my giveaway. Go join the Discord. Go to the giveaway chat and go to the very bottom. I'm giving away, I think, five or ten more swag packs for the 705. So in honor of uh, the 705 coming out, ICOM gave me a big box full of swag. And so if you're interested in getting a boonie hat 
a lantern or a t-shirt if you watched last week's stream you saw that stuff or my 705 review video the giveaway is going on now for this week every time i do something with a 705 i'm going to try and splash in some giveaways and so the only way you're going to know about it is if you join me on the discord so make sure you join that now hopefully an admin can drop a link or go to the description the video description in the in below here and click on my discord and hop a, hop on over there again click on giveaway and go to the post for today about the giveaway of the swag and click the party horn. It's called a reaction, but reaction horn, party horn, whatever you want. Now, so HT antennas are still the best HT antenna is no match for like even a mag mount slapped on the side of a filing cabinet. I learned that as well. I, I had these whiz bang, you know, I had my um, eight, what is it? 874, I haven't used it in so long. The Nagoya 818. 890 anyway I'm, I'm just saying radio names right now i'm not even saying uh i'm not even saying real things oh lost the slides there we go and so i had all these cool ht antennas i thought and i was like wow uh i'm still not getting me out that far i ended up getting like a mag mount you know hooking my ht up to it man it's crazy the amount of difference you'll get so even the best ht you know antennas are not going to be like the best antennas and, that, and that's fine. You know, it, it, again, it's supposed to be a portable thing that you carry with you. It's an antenna that you use because it, it can be on the radio. But it's, it's nowhere near kind of, you know, where you want to be. Now, uh, something that I, I will point out that I feel like is happening more recently than in the past. A lot of people have been contacting me and saying that their Baofeng radios, when they're upgrading the antenna are performing worse so they're getting you know aftermarket antennas and uh like the nagoya 771 thank you nd you got it like the nagoya 771 or a signal stick or an abri and they say they can't hear anything but noaa uh they can't hear anything but noaa frequencies for some reason and they and they say hey uh, why is that so I don't know what's going on. There's something going on with Baofengs, I'm guessing, right now, or there's something going on with Abri antennas. I can't substantiate any of that, but I'm worried because it's a problem if you connect a, an upgraded antenna onto a Baofeng and the Baofeng just gets overloaded. That's not good at all. That means the front end of the radio is being so saturated by RF that it can't handle it it can't do anything with it which is not good and, and if that's happening that is very bad for for baofengs and my recommendation of a baofeng if that's a thing that that becomes the norm think for myself says hey josh i just passed my technician class license today thanks for your videos hey congratulations and thank you for the super chat i super appreciate it thank you very much all right mobile radios what did i learn about mobile radios do it <laughs> get one I, I went way too long for without having a mobile radio so that's the first thing i learned i should have got a mobile radio like way way early but i probably got you know lost in the attractiveness of the features that a lot of hts have and and we're talking about when i got licensed which was in 2007 there was still cool radios out at that time even though my ft60 was a workhorse and kind of did everything i needed for talking on repeaters you know, still, you, you get the idea. But what I learned after picking up a mobile is how much more effective mobile radios are. The 50 watts is much better for you. They're already kind of expecting a decent antenna, a quarter wave vertical, for instance, like a ground plane or something like that. And, and it works really well for them. So again, something I already mentioned, you know, the 50 watts output is going to be a lot more powerful than the 5 watts regarding your S unit power. So that makes Simplex a lot more effective. If you got buddies around town, you're, wor you're, you're thinking about having like an emergency group of friends and they're spread out, you know, maybe 10 miles or more away from each other, you definitely wanna think about having a mobile radio that you deploy in your home and in around that area, right? So that, and maybe get the same ones and program them all the same, have a little party, social distance backyard party where you program all the radios, you test them out, everybody thinks about the same antenna, does that whole thing, that would be a really good idea. So what I learned, mobile radios are where it's at. 
Old Fortune, new guy, says, all right, super chat, thank you very much. FT3DR, testing for my tech at the end of this month. Thank you for the good work from South OCCA. Right on, neighbor. I'm in Cerritos, so thanks for watching. And I got another one from Dan Barack or Barack. Grabbed my fang, went in a woods, and now I'm watching the live stream. Thanks, uh, everything, for what you do to this hobby. Well, you gave me a perfect segue opportunity. I, I gotta, I have to do this. I have to now. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna be able to find it. Uh, I don't know how she did it. Oh, is it is it in Fangang? Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, she did it in Fangang. Okay, cool. <laughs> Speaking of going in a woods. We got a Fang Gang Go In A Woods t-shirt. Case of emergency, grab Fang, go in a woods. There's also one for the G90, uh, for those of you that are the G90 enthusiasts out there. Leia, great work again. You're, you're fantastic in, in what you do. <laughs> so, okay. So now you got this mobile radio. I just told you go get a mobile radio. What I learned after getting a mobile radio, whoo boy, they got a lot of fan noise. Some more than others. And you can actually buy upgraded fans. PC fans often will work just fine with mobile radios. This radio in particular, the, uh, the ICOM 2730, it needs a fan to keep it cool. But, man, when it kicks on, you can appreciate that it is definitely on. If you're talking for a while, you're doing a net or something like that, yeah, it, it's loud. It can get loud. So that's why I've remoted mine. That's another good uh, reason for a remote kit. You can hide the body of the radio... Get it away from me. Just get it away. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, another thing on that. Um, those The notes on fan noise will generally pop up in reviews. So wherever you go for your ham radio reviews, there's eHam, right? eHam, just Google eHam. There is QRZ. Even Amazon, believe it or not. There's a lot of pretty decent reviews on Amazon. So check that out. Scarl4334 says, You are literally describing the last first couple of months of, of my ham journey. Lol, you are our Elmer. Hey, I went through it too. I'm not your Elmer. I'm just further along the path. I'm, I'm literally... I've, I, I, okay. I'm not going to be pretentious about this. Everybody pretty much went through most of these problems. When you're looking at this for the first time, it is a like change in your concept of, of how radio works. It's a real thing. And, and there's no reason uh, to expect that anyone before you didn't also go through that. So I'm not pretentious. I think everybody, you know, we all, we're just at different points on the trail, if you will, and, and we got to work together. So let's talk about antennas. I get a lot to talk about antennas. So who's like this? I was like this. Okay, I lived this. I want all the bands in one antenna. I want to just have one little baggie with my antenna in it, and I want to be able to do everything I want. This is when I first started out. I wanted to do this. This is what I wanted, right? Everybody wants this. They want an all-in-one radio. You want an all-in-one antenna. You want it. It's Everybody <laughs> lives this. So when I first got into HF, I loved the idea of a multi-band antenna that could do it all. So I bought a 9 to 1 on on off eBay. This is it. It's the urchi.org uh, 9 to 1 on on special. It, it, these things have been around for a very long time. Many, many people have them. Okay. I had trouble with it. Why did I have trouble? Because I just plugged it into the back of my radio. And that's it. I, I had the antenna box. I had the antenna in the air. I had coax. That's all you got to do. And I had it connected to my radio. Well, no, no, dir, it's not going to work because 9 to 1 on ons generally require a tuner, which we'll talk about here shortly. Since I was a new general, my setup wasn't favoring getting an antenna up high. I made a few contacts on PSK31, but not much more. Well, how did I solve this problem? Obviously, let's take it to a summit. Let's get this thing on the air. This is an unrelated uh, image of me doing a soda activation. I don't have a picture of that first soda activation. I do somewhere. I just don't know where it's at. So obviously, it's not the it's not the antenna's fault. Uh, and K8MRDs in the house saying nine to one for the win. I I don't I don't dislike nine to ones as much as I did in the past, right? But for a while, it hurt me. 
I'll show you, show show me on my body where the the nine to one unun hurt me. It was right here. It was on this. It was on this finger. It was on this hand somewhere in here. Uh, so I just assumed, well, I needed to get the antenna up off the air. That was my problem. So my bag, I had this LNR LD4, you know, LD5. I think it's an LD5. Dragged it up to a soda activation. I had my, I still have it, the same pocket tuner that I did the, the video of. Dragged all this stuff up to the summit. Got it up on the air, and, and yeah, I ended up burning myself with it. I failed. I failed that activation. It was my first soda attempt. Totally failed. It happens, you know? I made a video on it. I had fun. It was I will go I I've got to I've got to do it at some point. I got to go back to that summit. That summit was a ball buster. Really really tough hike. So, this is the other thing, right? We all probably have gone down this road. I I could as I said here, I could make many many slides on this, but there are hams that take the name literally of antenna tuner to assume the tuners are effing magic boxes. That's, a, that's an engineering term we use in the industry, effing magic boxes, that fix all the antennas issues. That's not what a tuner does, right? A tuner is really an antenna matching system. Its job is to give your radio a 50 ohm impedance no matter what's going on with your antenna. It doesn't matter if it's a spaghetti noodle. At least it will try. Some are better than others. Uh, 50 ohm impedance to match the antenna, so the radio puts out full power. It doesn't do anything more than that. Nothing else. However, some antennas, like a 9 to 1 unun, require a tuner. A G5RV likely will require a tuner. I also bought one of those and used that. What did I learn? Get yourself a tuner. But what I learned from getting a tuner is that... Basically, this is kind of what led me down, you know, the changing of my mind on, on the types of antennas I like. At the time, I didn't realize the concept of, of compromised antennas. I went straight for a multi-band antenna, what was affectionately or is affectionately known as, as a random wire antenna. I understood a bit about Yaggies and Gain, but I figured, hey, it's still a wire. I'm sure it's fine. Well... Okay, after the 9 to 1, I built a dipole, and it worked considerably better for me at home. Well, what was different about that is that was a monoband resonant dipole on a very specific frequency. It was pretty wide-banded enough to, I believe, cover all of 20 meters. What else did I learn from starting out with a 9 to 1 unun? Lots of gear. You end up compiling all this stuff to take along. And again, this is not an example of that. This is paring the system down, getting it small. When I had that LNR, I'm running a QRP radio. LNR doesn't have an internal battery, so I'm dragging a battery out. LNR didn't have a tuner, so I'm dragging a tuner out. Uh, I didn't. The SWR meter didn't work very well on that radio, so I'm dragging out an SWR meter for a 9 to 1 unun. I would have been better if I just put up a dipole. Now, <laughs> I've been hitting the 9 to 1 on on really hard. I don't dislike the 9 to 1 on on. I just, you know, this is this is my journey. This is what I went through, right? This is what I had to deal with. You're you're not you're not going to have that big of a problem with it if you're heeding my words, right? You will need to deal with this stuff. Uh, if the radio crammed more things inside the chassis, it made it easier to pack for field work. Case in point, that uh, radio that's right there is a Elecraft KX1. It's a CW only radio, but it has an internal power supply and a built in tuner. Well, that would have worked fantastically with the 9 to 1 on on if I had had that and if I had known CW at the time. I still don't know it that well, but I would have been better off. <laughs> All right. So, uh, a couple other things. This is where we're dipping into. Some of the things people have sent me, some of the things I experienced, confusion over radio operating modes. Ooh, hey, we got a little bit of overlap there. Why'd that happen? Why not just use CW on your handheld? Hey, this comes up a lot. I get asked this a lot. Why not just use CW on your handheld so you get all the benefit of CW? In general, handhelds are FM. They transmit out FM, frequency modulation. This means they modulate an FM signal to transmit. 
and they demodulate an FM uh, receive signal for listening. Continuous wave, which people confuse all the time. Morse code is the language of converting dits and daws into characters, right? That's Morse code. I could blink Morse code. I can use a flashlight for Morse code. That's just me using that language, basically. The mode for ham radio to use Morse code is called CW, which stands for continuous wave. Continuous wave is unlike FM. Continuous wave is a very narrow bandwidth because all it's doing is sending out a single sine wave tone, right? You can adjust the hertz of that tone, but it's generally just one tone. And it's the modulation of the on and off of that tone that allows you to send Morse code. So if you did more, so if I PTT'd my HT and, and sent in me going, dee, 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 I'm not doing CW. I'm doing Morse code over FM, right? So that was a fun, uh, I, I've had to explain that many times, but we will demonstrate it. I want to show this one because I think the understanding the modes is pretty important. So we're looking at my 705 here. I'm going to hit the dummy load. All right, dummy load. So we're on upper sideband, so I can go Kilo India 6, November. Oh, we got to we gotta span that way back. Here we go. Kilo India. No, no, no. Wait, which one was it? I got to find the right one. It's this one. Yeah. Kilo India 6. Oh, my God, you can't even see it. Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. So I have to span one more. Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. That is upper sideband. Remember we talked about the carrier, right, in AM frequency? Carrier is the middle. Upper sideband is to the right, to the higher side of the frequency. Lower sideband is to the left. I can switch this. Now we're on lower sideband. Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu, right? Let's flip it to AM. Now I want you to pay attention to the width. No, that was not what I want. Kilo India 6 November Alpha Zulu. That's a center carrier with both sidebands, but big, right? We're going from 14.158 to where was it? Kilo India 6 November Alpha Zulu up past up almost to 164 megahertz. Let me flip it to CW. Okay. And I realized I don't have the key connected. I was tuning up my amp. I was tuning up my amp on the 7300, so I didn't have the key connected. Come here, key. All right, so here we go. Or not. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to how to use the 7300 real fast. We're going to go to one. We already did this in another video, but I'm just going to make sure I've got the right key set. Key type, paddle. No, should be straight. Okay. <laughs> it's not doing anything. What's going on? Let me write it. What's going on here? I'm gonna have to go to the paddle. I was trying not to use the paddle. I wanted to use the straight key. Okay, we're gonna have to use the paddle. So the reason why I didn't want to use the paddle is it's gonna it's gonna give me dits and daws automatically because it's got a built-in keyer. Oh, that's right. Well, look at that size now. Oh, we got the giveaway. So we went from we went from massive voice, and I'll do the giveaway in a second here. So back to single sideband. Same, I'm, I haven't changed it. Kilo India six November Alpha Zulu. See how wide my voice is. I have to, 
I have to talk, right? My, my modulation, the voice, the complexities of human voice is coming through the microphone, Kilo India 6 November Alpha Zulu. But what do I need for CW? Well, for CW, I don't need that. I purely just need dits and daws. I mean, yeah. Right? Easy. Ooh, these are fast paddles. I haven't used these in a while. Right? So the the ability to send out Morse code in the forms of dits and daws is much smaller bandwidth requirement, so it's much more effective. You can't do that on an FM because here's what FM looks like. So again, we're talking about transmitting on FM, but going, okay, Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. Look how wide FM is. So if I go, you went from a bandwidth which was 400 hertz to a bandwidth which is huge, right? Massive bandwidth. Yeah, so we'll we'll leave it at that. So yeah, hopefully you get the idea. That was a bit of a demonstration on the differences in the bandwidths. You, you don't want to use uh, C Morse code, if you will, on an FM radio. It's of no value. Uh, can the 705 do 160? Yes, it can. Right there, 1.8. It goes all the way up. Well, here, I'll just show you. Those are the frequencies it does. It goes from uh, 160 all the way through 70 centimeters. You couldn't have, you know, basically the uh, 7300, the 705, really good demonstrator radios. That's I literally have a webcam that's right in front of me that I'm pointing, um, that I'm pointing directly at. It makes it really easy. Let me go back over here really quick, too. So there's an example of what the band activity looks like. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Of course, FT8's blowing up. So, All right, back to the slides. Thanks for sticking with me, sticking through it. All right, so we demonstrated it. I'm going to get another drink. That was the Brute. That was the Brute Cider. Good. Again, I like dry cider. Not sweet, dry. And that was very good. So take that for what's worth if you think you like what I like. No, so Don, if you want to do two, uh, 220 megahertz, you need to go up. To, uh, you're talking about, wait, 1.2 meters? So now we're going to try the rosé or the brosé. All the bros drinking rosé these days. Ooh. Almost tastes drier than the brute. The brute. That's not right. All right. A note about learning ham radio. Like when you have questions or you're unsure. That is my 2017 ARRL handbook. Everyone should go get an ARRL handbook. I would. It's better if you get a newer one, but I'm still using the 2017, or it's like literally two years ago. It's not that big a deal. And they work fantastic they work really really well the, the content is pretty much the same for most of the topics it is a wealth of knowledge it is a fantastic reference that if you find someone that is interested in ham radio if you are yourself interested in ham radio get yourself an AWRL handbook it will answer so many of your questions it will solve many of your problems sometimes it is not the most approachable thing. It's not the easiest thing to read in all situations because it's usually pretty compacted, the information. But hopefully it gives you the right direction for which to build off of. I hope that makes sense. Um, so definitely a double RL handbook. Now, <laughs> I got to mention this. QRZ.com and eham.net. There is a minefield of personalities on these services. The websites themselves uh, can be difficult sometimes to get through due to the comments that the, the discussions that go on on that website. With that said, there is a lot of very smart people on that website that contribute, that have been contributing for decades now, basically. And 
there's still good stuff to have in there. Case in point, when I was dipping my toe into packet radio, when I was first getting started with packet radio, there and actually it was the same person that I was making contacts with on ALE, if you remember when we did the ALE um, stream. Uh, this YL uh, basically had this really good set of posts on on packet radio. And I did much, I, I replicated a lot of what she had did to get me started uh, because I had the same TNC she was working on, which is a terminal node controller, which is a device that interfaces between the radio and has local memory and does a lot of things automated so you don't have to have a computer connected all the time, like running a personal bulletin board so people can send you messages. It's a great little box. It's it's very old school. It's like super nostalgic old school. It's this little box that's on top of the radio, and if people message you, it's got a light that says you have mail, or you know what does it say? Ma no, it literally says mail. It's a little light that that turns on when you have mail, and you hop into your PBS, your your mailbox, and you, and you're on the air. It's all over ham radio. It's fantastic. And last but not least, you got to Google stuff or DuckDuckGo. Maybe give the nod to DuckDuckGo. If you go down the road of searching for anything online, I, I put the AWR handbook way at the top. It, it's very solid. If the information you're looking for is in there, absolutely use the handbook. But if you start going down the list, start getting more than one um, resource. Start getting one more than one piece of information to, to grab onto. And, and just keep that in mind, right, as you, as you build and go. So I, I did reach out to Discord, like I said, mixing posts. You know, when I asked, what what did you learn? What were some of the trials and tribulations that you went through when you were starting out in ham radio? And, and he said, don't take anyone's word on anything. Check it out and verify it yourself, either by testing or research, especially manufacturer spec and stuff from China. All very, very good. So types of content I see online talking about this where do you go how do you find stuff what do you do so i've generally found like very interesting very useful and kind of total hearsay stuff that comes out on ham radio now they can all be like a smattering of each really entertaining but also totally not based on anything claims that i've heard uh ham radio has a lot uh, of, of the following content which is kind of like unsubstantiated claims this is like online just all online in general Mostly their claims are technically accurate, very detailed, very helpful, and demonstrations of write-ups is kind of what you see. YouTube has had an effect on all of that, right? It has changed the way tons and tons of information gets shared, particularly with ham radio. It's, it's absolutely crazy what's happened in the last like three years or so on YouTube. But YouTube itself lends itself to kind of a like show, don't necessarily tell right kind of situation and so not only are these types of videos generally more fun to watch the show don't tell for the creator when captured correctly like when i capture something on video it lends itself to good storytelling so if i go out in the backyard and i'm going to build an antenna and i take video to walk you through it well i've got a, a start a middle and an end right it's all built in for me if i'm walking you through it the story is built in in building the antenna uh, the demonstrations often, though, not the easiest way to convey a complicated point. So like explaining to you what a trap does, an antenna trap. Well, what's the difference between a loading coil and a trap? Hmm. Kind of hard to demonstrate without some test equipment or, or some appropriate stuff. And many times I've just thought to myself, well, I could just do this. I could point a camera at a whiteboard and solve this whole thing faster by drawing it out. But what's the downside of that? is that those type of videos often come off, come off as kind of dry, slow, and sometimes boring. So YouTube tends to sometimes lend itself to kind of the more whiz-bang flashy stuff, which I think is great. So it's good to have, again, going back to your handbook for reference. So if you hear someone reference what a trap is, or I'm using a trapped dipole, what does that mean? Well, pull out your handbook and, and go figure it out. I get a ton of comments on hey, Josh, you use far too many acronyms in your videos. Please stop. And I want to say, like, hey, please open your handbook and, and figure out what the acronym means. Because what, what tends to happen is I'm using the, the acronym because if I don't, 
It's going to take the whole thing a lot longer to explain by explaining it out. So generally, if you find something that you don't understand, maybe reach out to me. YouTube comments is sometimes not the best way. And, and ask the question, right? Uh, so yeah, definitely get a handbook. All right, so let's walk through some of the Discord lessons learned. Oh, we already passed the hour. Man, this one flew by. I had a lot of fun with this. Because I get, uh, <laughs> Leia, my wife, again, it, my wife, if you haven't uh, subscribed to our podcast, the Hammer You Crash Course podcast. I make it really easy for you. You can go find this really easy. Do it because it's my wife and I talking about ham radio. And I'm literally dragging her kicking and screaming into the world of ham radio. Last week, she and I sat down in front of my HF radio and Leia made five contacts. And it was awesome. She was on the radio. I recorded a, her Colin Cuso, Colin CQ. And I just let it play. And she got people coming back super fast. It was ridiculous. And so we walked through that on the podcast. So make sure to join us over there. Hammer to Crash Course Podcast, wherever you podcast. So one painful lesson from Mike, N8YO says, is common mode RFI. He learned that lesson. I learned that lesson from burning myself on a summit. But, you know, we all find our different ways to hate RFI. Um, so he was saying that, the use of balans and ununs at the antenna and chokes within the shack, but those should only be used after resolving the source of the RFI. Very good point, Mike. Very, very good point. I've done multiple videos on that, so um, if you want to, you know, um, see the best results of some of my trials and tribulations again on choking out RFI, when in doubt, choke it out when it comes to RFI, go look at some of my past videos i believe the video is titled we are killing ham radio and this is how or something like that and it's with rfi all of our crazy electronics we buy all of our new whiz bang electronics your phone that does uh, wireless charging what do you think that's doing it's transmitting that's a transmitter guess what if your antenna is too close um man <laughs> you're gonna hear that Locky, the village idiot, is my favorite. Thank you, Locky. And I think he has Killdozer as his avatar. Uh, yeah, sorry, too much wine. Honestly, I think the hardest part as a wet behind the ears guy is I'm a hands on learner. I need to feel it, see it, experience it for it to sink in. And everything ham radio for me has been through a screen. That's. I guess he's watching my videos. More recently, Lessons was watching the video with Modern Rogue, where you, you, where you tuned to the wrong signal versus antenna, and you burned your finger. That was, oh, this is one of those kind of hobby <laughs> moments. It can be. Yeah, so um, yeah, there was multiple reasons for why I, I, I RFI'd my, or RF'd my finger on that one. Which is largely due to the way we had the antenna configured. But yes, there's a lot to learn in the hobby. So hopefully we had fun. Hopefully you had fun. Because you, if you're not having fun with it, you won't stick through all this. There's just too much There's just too much heady stuff to keep track of. Don N5 SKT says, I wish I knew more about the difference between verticals and dipoles. I mainly used a random wire, and my world changed when I got my R6 vertical. I, I say the same thing. I, I agree completely. Connor, I wish someone had explained to me how antennas are basically a choice between multiple big resonant antennas or a multiband requiring a tuner. We talked about that. Indeed, that is very true. He also said, this is somewhat of a tangent, but I didn't realize how sensitive SDRs are and how their cost is a trade-off for a really over oversensitive re receiver. The local radio station just deletes everything because it's 50 kilowatts so that's um that can be true with some SD, uh, sdrs like the little dongles they can get a lot of uh interference if you will off-band interference from broadcast stations am am is usually the worst that you need a band pass filter for for the commercial band and that'll pretty much knock it out and those are great to use on sdr receiving sdrs because you're not going to transmit through them Redacted said, I also learned that radio manufacturers are stuck in the 90s, and a lot of them still use proprietary chargers instead of standard chargers, such as micro USB or USB C. 
Yes, that is that is a thing. Uh, you're going to need to have a power supply of some kind or a drop-in charger. Drop-in chargers are really nice. Um, or have some kind of AC adapter to go along with it. Mark W. says, always spend the money on good coax. But, Connor replies, you don't have to buy $20 a foot quadrillion shield hardline either. Correct. There is a balance. Um, but you, you definitely... You definitely should find the balance. I'm looking some I'm reading some of the comments. I'll catch up with the comments in a second. Mixing mixing says, don't take anyone's word on anything. Check it out and verify it yourself, either by testing or research, especially manufacturer specs from China. Uh, I think I already got that. I think it was a copy. It was. Mark Shaw, Marky Shaw said, I wish I would have understood that there is no perfect antenna. Everything is a compromise in some way. Never be hesitant to deploy whatever you can get your hands on and see what kind of performance you get. Marky, that is a, a really good point. Even though I have RFI'd myself, RF'd myself, I still try. In fact, I have a, I have a new um, Will It Antenna video coming out that I'm editing, and I, I, did, R, I did RF burn myself again. And somebody was commenting about Connor. That is a different Connor. <laughs> so just so you know, that Connor is not the Connor, the, the uh, contest daddy Connor. Um, oh, good one. Marky W. Coax cable. Unhook your gear during a lightning storm. I, I ask lessons learned, which usually means there was a failure associated with the lesson that they learned. Hopefully it wasn't that he burnt his shack up. Loki or Loki's back. Yes, so I understand that there is no silver bullet for antenna. The thing that is torturing me is how each antenna changes between them from HT to mobile station. What antennas are more for one type of radio versus another? Um, this is another good point as people go, well, does this antenna not work for everything? Why doesn't it work for everything? And I talked about it a bit, but the basic idea is if you took a piece of wire, two pieces of wire, made a dipole, just long pieces of wire. There is a bandwidth, a useful space, and it looks like a parabola. It looks like a bowl or a tight bowl, big bowl. Usually a big bowl if it's a dipole and the, uh, and the wire is appreciably thick. That is the frequency space in where the antenna is resonant. At the deepest point, that is where the antenna is most resonant for that frequency. If you add things like a coil of wire to reduce the overall length of the antenna, you are also making your bowl more of a vase, right? It, it's closing up that parabola, that U in the bottom. So you kind of have to make a choice. Do I want something that's very, uh, very short, easy for me to put on the roof, like the GRV Junior, or I had a GRV Lite that had traps? That allowed me to get on 80 meters, but it was extremely narrow banded. I couldn't get all the way down to the digital and CW portion of the band. It was tuned for 75 meters. So there's no one thing, you know, kills, has all the answers. Further, just a simple two meter radio, or two meter antenna, that's cut for a band space that it is going to be most resonant at because that length of antenna matches the frequency and the impedance of the feed line and the antenna and the radio, and that's what allows it to resonate. So it's matched to the antenna. So there is, there is no one silver bullet. It changes all the time. Mixing again, my first serious radio purchase of $500 was a radio I thought would transmit on any legit frequency provided I had the right antenna. It only transmitted on HF. Uh, again, that's the that, that's the expensive version of, well, I just got this Baofeng. I'll just program it on CB and see what happens. Read the box. Read the, read the specs. Ethan, one of our mods, says QRP is not inherently, not inherently cheap or a good beginner option. We talked about this last week. I, I, again, agree. Getting on radio and having fun is much more important than a perfect or best equipment or antenna. Three. Have fun with what interests you and what you have, not what people see say you should be interested in. I agree. Jeremy, 
When I first started out in amateur radio a few years ago, I thought the only way I was going to make any contact was to buy the best antenna, spend weeks on figuring out how it's not going to fit my two-story house and backyard, and worrying about grounding for lightning strikes. Instead of just getting out there with just about anything and getting to it. Exactly. Um, Jeremy, with another lesson that might have been more relevant years ago, is to find a community that you mesh with. Local groups might be, uh, might be it, but also find Discord groups, Facebook groups. Twitch has a ground of a good following of like-minded people. I agree. Shout out to our Discord. Link in the description. And our Facebook. I just noticed we passed 11,000 people, 11,000 members of our Facebook. If you're watching me on Facebook, by the way, I apologize. I don't have integration for chat into the live stream yet. I don't even know if it's working over on Facebook right now. I tried to pull it up, but I couldn't see it. Come over on the YouTube side and comment over here. I use that as more of a reminder. Zortness K6GG says, I severely underestimated the power and quality of a simple inverted V dipole made out of cheap wire. I agree, sir. I spent so much time and effort messing with balans and ununs, but my best antenna has been an inverted V wire that cost me like $10, plus $100 for the fiberglass pole, but hey, still. But I had bought that for, uh, un for other antenna purposes. Okay. Perfect example. Just build yourself a, a dipole and, and get on with it. Mark Shaw, back again, on my on my first mobile install, oh, this is a good one, actually. I ran a wire for power from my battery without a fuse or circuit breaker at the battery end. One day, I was rearranging some stuff, pulled a little too hard on the line, stripped a bit on the metal, and the wire lit up like a Christmas tree and burned several of my wiring harnesses for other components in the car, like my air conditioner. Radio was fine because it was fused, but everything else in between got fried. Always fuse the things. Yes. Uh, Eric posts, Best lesson I have ever learned was from a guy at a local club when it comes to antennas, feed lines, tuners etc experimentation is the key to success you can only learn so much from reading a book at the end of the day it's if you've got an idea whether it be for an antenna or whatever else even if you don't know what you're doing build it and see what happens most likely you'll learn something along the way too for my first antenna i strung up a bunch of wire in the air stuck a nine to one on it and tuned it up within hours i got it working zl too long, don't read. Send it. I'm still going to send it, bro. Who's got a, what's a, Larry Enticer, right? Yeah. I'm still going to send it. Need my Canadian tuxedo to, to say that, right? All right. Last one. Last slide. Because I'm going to wrap up the stream here. We're already past an hour. Redacted said, I learned over time how crappy UV5R truly is. I left this for last because I want to hit it really quickly. That's not a UV5R. That's UV3R. I already used a UV5R, though, so I wanted to mix it up. The pros of a Baofeng UV5R is they are cheap, and they're pretty easy to use. They're pretty easy to program. If you kill it, who cares? Very cheap, whatever. Cons, they are cheap, meaning the material, the quality, the lack of filtering often. They are cheap for a reason. You get a bit of cheap quality to go along with that, and that is okay. It's fine to use a Baofeng, but they are the high point of ham radio. If you're watching me as, as a self-reliance person, the Baofeng is the high point of ham radio. I'll just throw that out there. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, it's just a simple analog radio. It's an FM dual band AM FM, or FM radio. And most, most are identical in their function. I get the alphabet soup of the different models of Baofengs. Hey, I'm thinking about the BFF8HP, but I'm also thinking about this 9FY to the squared 12W Baofeng. Which one is better? doesn't matter. They're pretty much all the same. If they're dual band, it doesn't even matter if it's a 5 watt versus 8 watt. You don't really get that much difference out of it. Doesn't matter. It's got like the same menu system. The functionality is almost identical for the dual banders. Now, when you start dipping into the DMR ones and the tri banders, eh, it's a bit different. But at the end of the day, it's still a Baofeng, so it's going to function very similarly. So 
that is it. That is all I have on the slides today. Boy, I hope you uh, appreciated that, enjoyed it. Again, hit subscribe. I do mean that when I say it. Thank you for watching. I um, I try and I try and put the slides together. In this case, this is really fun because I got to kind of just talk through all my <laughs> all my failings, and I, I think it's really cathartic for people to learn through hearing other people fail. And I've definitely failed, and so I have no problem telling you about it. And you know, it's it's fun doing that. So what we're gonna do right now? Um, oh, I got it. I gotta do the. Uh, You know what? This is what I'll do. Uh, the giveaway happened. If you're already on my Discord, you know who the winners are. We will talk about it on the after chat. That's probably the best way to, to handle it. So if you haven't already, look in the description for the Discord link and join the after chat, which is a voice chat and text chat. We talk about ham radio, continue the whole discussion we've had here. We'll likely be talking about more of our lessons learned and fun things we've been doing in ham radio. I'm going to throw it over, though, and give a big thanks to my patrons here. Thank you, patrons, for making this possible. Last week was uh, the Patron Picks episode, which is about getting started on HF or what you should know about HF. And today was a bit of a follow-on of that. I, I had so much fun with that last live stream. I thought that it would be really good if we just kept it going and, uh, and, and did the whole thing again, but talk about lessons learned across all of ham radio. And I definitely have learned a lot of lessons. So big thanks again to the patrons. I am still with my my brose here from Crispin Ciders. It's a cidery. I think it's a cidery. I um I will give the nod to the brute. The brute is better if you uh if you end up going down that road. Is it Miller? Is it Miller? It better not be. That's frustrating. Again, thank you to the patrons. Without your help, uh, a lot of this is not possible. And um, do regardless of whether you won the giveaway today, I will be doing giveaways pretty much until the swag is gone. And I have a mountain of swag. So definitely join the Discord because that's how I'm doing it. And, and hopefully it's going to be the same every time. It's going to be a giveaway. You click. You win. I send you an email. You fill out a form. It's very simple. We're where to send it. That's it. That's all we got to do. So did I already flip it? Did we flip? No, I don't think we got through it yet. Um, okay. Where's my chat? Before I wrap this up, we got any last remaining questions? Adam Forsberg, what's your problem with Miller? I, the only Miller I've like really um, been okay with is High Life. Uh, I never liked Miller Lite. I never liked MGD. I don't like macro beers in 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 general. That's just me. I, I'm I'm not hating on it. Uh, but you know, there's there's kind of a running joke that everybody gives uh, the smoking ape a lot of, uh, the smoking ape a lot of crap over him drinking Miller Lite. I try not to, but I I do find the um, I find him mentioning the six gold medals uh, really funny. He really beats that drum hard, and, and maybe that's why the whole thing I, gets so much laughs. Anyway, I am Josh, KI6NAZ. I hope you enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun. Hop over on our Discord, hop over on our Facebook, and subscribe because I live stream every Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I try to post a video in there once a week as well. The shorter videos, this week was the Step IR video for part two. We got two more parts of that video coming, and a whole wealth of videos that I've got in the shoot and I'm working on for the 705, because there's a lot still to cover on this radio, even on that whole two-hour live stream I did covering it. Still got a lot more I'm going to talk about. So that's it. I'll talk to you later.